Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us this evening. Um, my name is Santiago Ivan Guerra. I am the director of the Hubbard Center for Southwest Studies. Um, today, we have a great event planned for you all. Um, we have um, Dr. Vanessa Fonseca Chavez from Arizona State University. Um, I'll turn the virtual screen over to my colleague, Karen Roybal, in a few minutes uh, so that she can do the formal introduction uh, for our speaker today. Uh, but before we do so, um, I do want to recognize uh, the indigenous people uh, here where we are currently housed in uh, Colorado, but also um, since today's uh, talk, we'll deal with um, New Mexico as well as um, our speaker today is in Arizona. I also wanted to take a moment since we're in this virtual setting to recognize the indigenous populations of our neighboring states. So first, I'd like to acknowledge the indigenous people and ancestors who lived and survived on the lands where Colorado College and the Hubbard Center is located, particularly Apache, Arapaho, Comanche, Cheyenne, and the Ute on whose unceded territories Colorado College was founded. In addition, I'd like to recognize um, the several Pueblo communities uh, throughout New Mexico, uh, as well as the several different Apache groups uh, in New Mexico and Arizona, as well as uh, the Yaqui Oyome people, uh, the Tahona Odom, and the Hopi. Um, and with that said, I'd also like to recognize, because uh, we're in the midst of celebrating International Women's Day, uh, to be mindful of the fact that. Um, La Lucha Sigue for uh, women's rights and for equity uh, across um, our different sort of gendered ident identifications. Um, today in particular, I also would like to recognize uh, the different people that helped make today's event possible, uh, particularly the staff at Colorado College that's uh, helping with all the uh, logistical uh, virtual work, uh, Erica Hardcastle and Jeff Hartman, uh, as well as our paraprof, uh, Sarah Kotsev. Um, and with that, I'd like to turn it over to uh, my colleague, Karen Ribal, uh, who helped make today's talk possible. So Karen, take it away. Thank you, Santiago, and welcome everybody. Thank you for being here tonight. I'm very excited to introduce our speaker, uh, Vanessa Fonseca Chavez, who is also a Nuevo Mexicana, so um, who I've known for a number of years. And I want to talk a little bit about her and the introduction that I'm going to do can't do all that she's done justice, but uh, she's from Grants, New Mexico. She received her MA in Hispanic Southwest Studies from the University of New Mexico and her PhD in Spanish Cultural Studies from Arizona State University. She's currently an assistant professor of English at ASU where she teaches undergraduate courses on Chicano and Chicana literature, indigenous literature, and Southwest Literature and Film, as well as graduate courses in the MA Narrative Studies program. In addition to that, she also co-directs the Following the Manito Trail project with Levi Romero, and I hope you'll ask her about that in the Q&A because it's a very exciting project. She also recently co-edited with Levi Romero and Spencer Herrera the anthology Querencia, Reflections on the New Mexico Homeland. Her book, which she will be speaking from tonight, is called Colonial Legacies in Chicana and Chicano Literature and Culture, Looking Through the Kaleidoscope, which was published in October of 2020 with the University of Arizona Press. Dr. Fonseca Chavez is a great friend and I'm very happy to welcome her here tonight. So welcome Dr. Fonseca Chavez. Thank you, Karen, uh, for that introduction. I'm going to start by sharing my screen and please let me know. Um, I do have double screen, so let me know if for some reason you're not seeing it um, in the right uh, sort of format. And just to verify that everyone is seeing it, it's not in presentation mode yet, but I wanna make sure it's on the right screen. Looks good, Vanessa. Okay. Um, and are you seeing the timed section or the full PowerPoint? I am seeing the timed section with the next slide. How about now? There you go, there you go. Perfect, okay, thank you. So again, um, good afternoon everyone and thank you for joining this talk today. I'm really excited, um, one, because uh, Colorado has a special place within the Manito diaspora and especially for New Mexicans who have traveled 
through Colorado to Colorado um, en route to other places are also as sort of a second homeland for Novo Mexicanos. We know that Southern Colorado is often seen as an extension of the Manito homeland. And so it's exciting uh, to at least be here in a virtual environment with you today to talk about uh, my book uh, or a chapter from it rather, uh, Colonial Legacies in Chicana and Chicano Literature and Culture, which was recently published by um, the University of Arizona Press. And fun news, um, if anyone is interested in purchasing a copy, um, the press is having a spring sale right now. So all books uh, through the University of Arizona Press are 40% off through March 15th. So that's certainly not a bad deal at all. So um, again, thank you to uh, the Holbert Center for Southwest Studies at Colorado College for hosting this virtual talk today. Um, I'll discuss a little bit about how I became interested in writing this book. And then I hope to use this virtual space to uh, have a productive dialogue on a topic that has been of interest to me for quite some time. Uh, that is how we celebrate or negate colonial legacies of Spanish conquistadores in New Mexico. Um, indeed, this has been a pressing topic for conversation um, over the past year or so. But what some of you may not know um, and what my book discusses is that this conversation has a long history in New Mexico dating back to at least the 16th century before New Mexico was ever a territory or a state. So uh, let me continue on with our next slide. And so this just gives an outline of what the overall book is about. Um, I will not have time today to talk about each chapter. Um, so I just wanted to briefly share the contents of it and the different literatures that I've drawn from to be able to um, pull this thread of colonial legacies throughout the Southwest in New Mexico, in Texas, and in Arizona. Uh, but the focus on my talk today is gonna be on that first chapter, The Sins of Our Fathers, but I'll draw from some of these other chapters um, in some instances to give you sort of a broader context. So as I've noted, um, I'm interested in exploring the topic of literary and cultural legacies. And so I began this presentation with a quote from Micaela Campos, a queer butch Chicana character from Emma Pettis's novel, Forgetting the Alamo or Blood Memory. This is a work of historical fiction, which centers on 19th century Texas, specifically during the time of the Battle of the Alamo and the Battle of San Jacinto. So at the beginning of the book, she talks a little bit about this legacy and she says, the next generation would take on the path, the weight of a past begun long before we were born and that weight endured into the next generation. Who would pick it up, measure it and say to each other, these are all lies, where's my real legacy? So in many ways, my path to writing this book stemmed from my own interest in both individual and communal legacies um, and the way in which we called out these lies uh, within the Southwest United States, specifically uh, at different moments in history where marginalized characters are um, involved. So when Micaela's character looked to the 19th century Texas borderlands, I looked to Northwestern New Mexico, to Kansas, to California, and to Mexico to learn more about my own family history and stories in an effort to better understand and to articulate what I came to see as a really complicated legacy. Uh, there's, no really e there's not really easy answers um, to the question of what one's real legacy is, um, but I think the tensions that arise as a result of assembling these pieces of these searches uh, is what I had hoped to untangle uh, within my book. So as a Chicana from New Mexico, um, I understand how complicated it is to come to terms with our colonial past, to recognize that I am both colonizer and colonized, even if I don't have all the fragments or information at my disposal to fully understand what that means through different moments of my own history and that of my family. Though I'm a proud Nuevo Mexicana, I also acknowledge that my more recent history is tied to Arizona, uh, where my grandfather was born and where he and his father worked as copper miners until he was called to serve in World War II. When he returned, he faced what many other Mexicanos faced in US society, rampant race-based discrimination that didn't allow him to eat, for example, at a diner counter with his Anglo friends. I'm aware of the ways in which the copper mining and military industries have exploited marginalized communities and they have extracted their labor. My paternal grandfather migrated with his family from Jalisco to a small town in Kansas where they worked as ferrocarrilleros or railroad workers, the only Mexican family in the town at that time. Uh, later, they would migrate traveling by train cars to California to become farm workers during the era of Cesar Chavez and the Chicano movement. And my Nana's family, the most Nuevo Mexicano ancestors I have, share the same cultural heritage that many supporters of Oñate have. So I chose these texts and materials that comprise my book because I saw myself or someone with whom I was familiar with in them. So each of these texts produced a different kind of visceral response. Maybe perhaps in the beginning a raised eyebrow that eventually grew to feelings of outrage at the ways in which our communities, our state, our nation, 
hold on to harmful legacies tethered to colonial practices. And I've been thinking about this book for a long time, at least 15 years. And for a long time, I only knew one way to respond. And that was just the way I felt about it. And during those 15 years, I struggled to find an appropriate or even sometimes inappropriate response to how we respond to ongoing acts of violence. It wasn't until I read Albert Memmi's The Colonizer and the Colonized that I really began to understand just how damning colonization really was and is. Uh, in my book, I use the image of the kaleidoscope to understand how colonial legacies contend with intersectional issues of race, class, and gender, and to comprehend how different historical moments and political urgencies have ruptured or shifted the way we view our individual and collective uh, subjectivities. And so to do the research for this, I felt it necessary to go out and buy a kaleidoscope and play with it a little bit and think about the different sort of configurations that might come to be as a result of us turning it forward, turning it backwards, sort of shaking it up. And I imagine this in my book to sort of be um, the world that we possess, right? This, this sort of whole worldview, um, marginalized characters, dominant figures, whatnot, and the way that we move through time by centering uh, particular ideologies um, while also silencing or um, not paying attention to necessarily sort of peripheral figures within this kaleidoscope. So I think that when we look at this image, for example, we're immediately drawn to that center image. And if we just adjust a little bit, we start thinking about how important it is that all these pieces um, take part in this configuration. We can't have this configuration without the pieces that are in the far left corner, the far right corner, et cetera. So we need all these different ideologies and perspectives to be able to understand the world in which we live. But sometimes we tend to gloss over those peripheral spaces and only focus on those sort of centered or dominant images. Uh, so Emma Pettis, a Chicana historian and novelist, uses the image of the kaleidoscope to refer to fragmented pieces of colonial identities that are produced by a myriad forms of violence. She notes that a decolonial imaginary is possible, quote, when kaleidoscopic identities are burst open and where the colonial self and the colonized other become elements of multiple mobile categoric identities. So while the legacies of Chicana literature and culture simultaneously inform and challenge colonial constructs, the kaleidoscope makes visible the rupturing of these fragments again and again via political, so, political and social urgencies. These colonial constructs represent a type of durability within Chicana and Chicano literature and culture that sometimes we are moved to disrupt and rupture. My book builds on this idea precisely because it's imperative to acknowledge layered colonial legacies and to understand how colonial thinking impacts categories such as race, gender, and class within this kaleidoscope. So I want to jump now into chapter one of my book, which I've titled The Sins of Our Fathers, uh, which will be the conversation that we will be having today. So one of the first events I attended at Arizona State University as a doctoral student was a film screening for John J. Valadez and Cristina Ibarra's documentary, The Las Conquistador which centers on this controversy surrounding the placement of the equestrian, AKA Juan de Oñate, statue at the El Paso International Airport. Um, as Karen mentioned earlier, I was uh, born in Grants, New Mexico, but I did live in Pohuaque for a number of years. And so I, I heard about Oñate controversies my entire life. I wasn't sure how I felt about them, but they were certainly part of my environment when I was growing up. Um, I was born in Grants, New Mexico, an economically unstable town following the uranium boom of the 1950s a place where indigenous and Hispanic communities continue to combat the devastating effects of the uranium industry and other extractive industries within rural spaces. And just 20 miles west of Grants is Acoma Pueblo, the site of the battle between the Spanish and the Acoma in 1599, a battle ordered by Oñate himself. So I watched this film with a curious familiarity to the debate about the Oñate legacy. I had read pieces of Historia de la Nueva México in my master's program, likely Canto 34, which narrates a massacre at Acoma Pueblo. And I didn't get too far into the documentary before I noticed a group of Hispanos who, like some members of my own family, traced their roots back to the Oñate expedition or the de Vargas expedition, and who conveniently overlooked the atrocities that their Spanish ancestors committed against indigenous people. And they continue to use a kind of colonial rhetoric that their forefathers used so many centuries ago. This kind of rhetoric was used in other areas of my book. And I'm thinking here about Cleofas Jaramillo's autobiography, Romance of a Little Village Girl, where she uses a Spanish ballad to frame her family history within the larger trajectory of Spanish male conquest. In the film, The Last Conquistador, Conchita Lucero marks this history as a quote, legacy to be extremely proud of. 
So viewing this film outside of New Mexico as a Nuevo Mexicana was really weird. I certainly could empathize with Conchita's logic and not being able to learn about her own history growing up, but I found it really difficult to reconcile the words and actions that followed. In the film, the Hispanic Culture Preservation League is a staunch supporter of the equestrian statue, and they see it as a way to honor a man who they credit for ushering Spanish culture into this part of the new world. Lucero's commentary about the unveiling of history in relation to the statue is complicated. Oñata has occupied similar spaces in the past through pageantry and statues placed prior to 2007, so before this statue was placed in El Paso. So it's not the first or second unveiling of history, and a curious viewer of the film may wonder how many unveilings are necessary to render a history visible. Or perhaps one might think about alternative ways to promote history if the number of statues and cultural productions does not yet seem effective. Cultural celebrations in the form of statues, bodies of literature, and embodied performances expose deep sociopolitical and historical wounds concerning the perceived benefits of colonization. And they are epicenters of debate in a state like New Mexico, which is home to multiple heritages and cultural backgrounds. In Sarah Bronwyn Horton's 2002 study of La Jornada statue placed near the Albuquerque Museum, uh, the one that was recently removed, one of the two that was recently removed, she states, and I quote, all in all, ceremonies seem to suggest not merely a reencuentro, a reencounter of Spaniards and Hispanos, but a return, a reinvigoration of Spanishness that aimed to collapse the gap between conquistador past and a less glorious present. So I began this chapter one of my book titled The Sins of Our Fathers by commenting on the 2018 Española City Council decision to no longer support the Española fiestas and the later decisions in the Santa Fe fiestas to abolish the entrada. These two fiestas are key stakeholders in celebrating the colonial legacies of Oñate and de Vargas, whom many New Mexicans view as pivotal to their cultural heritage via performative memory and ancestry. Spanish colonial legacies in New Mexico often are tied to 16th and 17th century colonizers. And it's not uncommon for families to seek out genealogical connections to Oñate's 16th century expedition, which included about 400 colonists. While Fray Angelico Chavez states that fewer than 40 of the colonists who arrived with Oñate permanently settled in New Mexico, many Nuevo Mexicanos laud Oñate as the founding father of New Mexico and count themselves among the descendants of New Mexico's original families. To a certain extent, celebrating the legacies of Oñate and de Vargas allow some Nuevo Mexicanos to feel as though they too had a part in ushering Spanish culture into their communities and they see themselves as ambassadors of that legacy. For Juan de Oñate, often referred to as the last conquistador, it was pivotal to uphold the legacy established by his father. So we can start to see this thread here. Mark Simmons explains, he was trying to emulate his father who had conquered, pacified, and settled a great portion of Nueva Galicia. Oñate considers himself the standard bearer and with eagerness accepted the challenge of adding fresh luster to the Oñate name. Oñate's ambition to create a legacy his children could inherit also led to the many sins he would commit. Uh, Simons con uh, Simmons continues, and I quote, Oñate's greatest, or grandest achievement rather, of course, resided in his establishment of a new kingdom, afterward downgraded to the status of a province within the Spanish empire. At the time, he had set great store by the titles of governor and adelantado, but he would have been pleased to know that 400 years later, he was still remembered and considered deserving of another title, father of New Mexico, end quote. Early in Simmons' study of Oñate, he notes that Oñate's desire to secure titles for himself could only be received if, quote, New Mexico proved to be a spectacular success, end quote. Though clearly the definition of spectacular is debatable in this case, uh, there is little in the historical record to demonstrate that this particular venture was anything close to spectacular. So in this chapter, I look at the notion of Oñate as a founding father for the basis of celebrations of cultural colonial projects, including literature, films, statues, and reenactment, reenactments of Spanish conquistador glory. I argue that viewing history through this lens creates blind or dark spots that are glossed over or ignored in favor of justifying patriarchal and colonial endeavors. Paramount to breaking down these barriers is a deeper understanding of when and why Oñata's name has been evoked in the context of ancestral fatherhood and a founding figure of New Mexico's Spanish heritage. 
Thus, my aim here is to look closely at the gap between the conquistador past and the less glorious present to which Sarah Bronwyn Horton refers to in her work on the Santa Fe fiestas. So in this work, my intent is to map this past through a literary cultural lens in order to expose the shifts and ruptures that occur within this particular history. So Gaspar Perez de Villagra's 1610 epic poem narrates a troubled expedition from the very beginning. From financing the venture to discontent and disagreement amongst the colonists, even before engaging in the colonizing mission. And it ends with the very battle that would become the final nail in the coffin, so to speak, for Oñate's reign as governor in New Mexico. Through Spanish culture, though Spanish culture, without a doubt, has left an indelible mark on the present day Southwest United States, Oñate's exile also demonstrates the shortcomings of this colonizer in securing an extension of homeland for Spain. Oñate's legacy, though filled with strife and lackluster accounts of the settling of La Nueva Mexico, receives a contentious boost as father of New Mexico. That 1610 marks the publication of Villagra's epic poem in Alcalá de Henares, Spain, and the exile of Oñate in the same year, his son Cristóbal followed him, provides an interesting juxtaposition of legitimizing colonial ventures while simultaneously losing desired power associated with the perceived benefits of colonization. So in the following slides, I want to explore briefly um, various contentions present through an analysis of the times of the poem Historia de la Nueva Mexico has been republished from 1610 to 2010. So in 1898, um, Los Periodiqueros, um, a group of individuals who were dedicated to uh, Spanish language news, uh, newspapers in New Mexico, um, and who were pivotal in the advent of the printing press in the mid 19th century, were in an advantageous position to advocate for the preservation of a Nuevo Mexicano literary legacy that was rooted in the 1610 publication of Historia. 1898 marks an interesting year for the publication of Historia in El Progreso, because this year saw the end of the Spanish-American War in which Cuba was engaged in a liberation struggle from Spain. Cuba's, Cuba was one of the last countries to secure independence from Spain in the 19th century and this was accomplished through US intervention. So the participation of Nuevo Mexicanos in the Spanish-American War as military uh, individuals displays a conflicted relationship with Spain. On one hand, Spanish language newspapers were publishing portions of Historia, an epic poem published in Spain documenting the colonial expedition to La Nuevo Mexico by Oñate. On the other, Nuevo Mexicanos fought in opposition to Spain as evidenced by the poem a los Voluntarios en Nuevo México by X, 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 who later was identified as Luis Tafoya. Published in 1898, the poem functions as an act of solidarity with the United States to secure Cuba's independence from Spain. According to Doris Meyer, Nuevo Mexicanos were aligning themselves with, with the principles of democracy and freedom that define US nationhood, while at the same time were engaged in publishing a literary heritage that linked them to Spain. So by 1900, um, Spain, Mexico, and the United States had claimed Historia as their own. And so this brings really important conversations about who owns sort of the literary heritage that is attached to um, Historia de la Nueva Mexico. And I won't go through all of these. So the next I wanna just point at is uh, in the 1930s, the first English translation of Villagra's epic poem appears in 1933 edited by Gilberto Espinosa and published by the Quivira Society, which was formed in the 1930s with the expressed intent of researching the early history of the Southwest United States and Northern Mexico. Its members included F.W. Hodge, who provided the introduction to Espinosa's edition of Historia, as well as Hammond and Ray, who would later write the first multi-volume historical text of Oñate in 1953, entitled Don Juan de Oñate, Colonizer of New Mexico, 1595 to 1628. The goal of the Quivira Society was to make available Spanish texts via English translations. Though Martin Rodriguez's inclination is that the reproduction and translation of this poem is not for literary purposes, but rather was motivated by possible use for history. So this is an interesting point to make because there are various moments throughout the um, reincantations of, of Historia's narrative where people have uh, seemingly confused its literary value and its historical value. And so uh, that becomes a premise that many people contemporarily will utilize to sort of justify this idea of a founding father by referring to this piece of literature. We know that literature is interpretation. Um, there are 
some historical facts asserted within that literary piece, but for the most part, it's an epic poem and should be read as a piece of literature rather than a, a uh, historical document. So in the 1990s, um, aside from references to Historia in books and scholarly publications, another version of the poem doesn't appear in full until 1992. This is of course interesting because it, is, it also marks the 400th anniversary of Christopher Columbus. And so uh, in large part in this chapter, I talk about how the poem has been invoked uh, both for anniversaries and celebrations uh, related to national or international sort of commemorations of uh, conquistadores. Um, it also leads to myriad discussions and conversations about what is being celebrated and why. Uh, the early 1990s was the first time in which during a three year period, um, Historia was published in Spain, the United States, and again in Spain. The timing again coincides with 500th anniversary celebrations, as well as a 400th anniversary again um, of the founding of the first settlement in New Mexico. So there were celebrations held in both 1898 and 1998 for Oñate. Those of course look very different, um, but it's important to note that prior to 1898, there wasn't a lot going on in terms of the celebration of the founding father narrative, though in 1898 and 1998, that certainly was present. So conversations in the 1990s demonstrate a pronounced interest in Oñate as the hero of Historia, with the nearing of the 400th anniversary celebrations of his role as first governor of New Mexico and the conquistador responsible for establishing the first Spanish town in present day northern New Mexico. As different ethnic groups in New Mexico respond to this, they make evident the very colonial contentions that originated in the 1610 publication of the epic poem. So 400 years after the arrival of Oñate to the Southwest and the subsequent military and religious colonization enacted upon native peoples, the memory of what transpires at the Battle of Acoma in 1599 and documented in Canto 34 of Viagra's epic poem remains. John Kessel declares, and I quote, regrettably the atrocities of Acoma and Santa Fe 1599 and 1680 live on in bitter memory. Certain descendants of Pueblos and Spaniards today, along with their respective sympathizers, remember conflict, not coexistence. The reasons for the present discord in relation to the supposed merits of the Spanish colonial past are vast. Furthermore, they can be attributed to the length that some descendants of Oñate will go to justify his legacy as the founding father of Spanish New Mexico. As the last Conquistador documentary screening finished in 2008, um, I'm in this audience in an auditorium at Arizona State. I left New Mexico for the first time and I'm watching this film. So Valadez poses a question for the audience to begin the discussion. And he says, do you think the filmmaker made this documentary with a colonial mindset? He's the filmmaker, he's asking the question. So my hand goes up in the air really quickly and I say, yes. Um, and I'm very apologetic um, about my tone, but I say, you know, I don't think that all Hispanos think like Conchita Lucero, who is one of, uh, the main sort of organizers and members of the Hispanic Cultural Preservation League as depicted in the film, The Last Conquistador. And I say, you know, surely someone better could have represented the sentiments of Hispanos in this debate, perhaps even those who did not share anti-Indigenous sentiments. So Valdez, he waits for me to finish and he says, you know, well, you have to think about Lucero's position. Her family has been in New Mexico since the 1600s and they have a deep investment in the state. She is proud of her background, da 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 da. And so his question I then came to realize was a loaded question and likely something that he encountered along his documentary tour before arriving at ASU. Um, so he's sort of baiting the audience in this, uh, in this scenario. And I say, yeah, 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 I know. My family has the same history. And I express the feeling that the perceived exclusion of one's history doesn't give people the right to deny others of theirs. The film clearly shows Lucero among others uh, taking on a colonizing tone and quickly disregarding opinions that do not fall in line with her own. Interestingly, an interplay by the directors themselves portray the inherent limits of sight and blindness that set up the parameters of the conflict and remind us of these sort of peripheral spaces within the kaleidoscope. So what one sees clearly, the other does not. And what becomes apparent, although they're using different strategies to do this, is that neither side can convince the other one what they refuse to acknowledge. So in the film, David Romo, a writer residing in El Paso says, quote, the idea of conquest is one that is very much a part of who we are today. By focusing completely on these notions that make a lot of sense to you, making no attempt to see the other pro person's point of view is how evil comes about, end quote. So the insistence on maintaining a Spanish colonial 
presence in the Southwest, specifically in New Mexico, is not only due to the ways in which we romanticize this legacy, but it also connects to the longevity of this period within the region's larger history. Catherine Verdery declares that the New Mexico Spanish colonization carries a cultural identity that refuses to surrender. So when we think about Spain controlling what is now the US Southwest for a period of 300 years versus the brief Mexican colonial period versus the time that the United States has been in control of the present day Southwest, we see that um, you know, clearly Spain has controlled the region for almost twice as long as the United States. And so Verdery says that identities will be less flexible wherever colonial states have had more extensive and deeper than shallower roots. So the cultural and historical politics that arise in the film can be understood then as a form of ideological durability. Valadez and Ibarra, the two filmmakers, thread the story of Hauser, the sculptor, throughout the documentary in ways that propose a really problematic path to reconciliation. As the film begins, the sculptor comments, and I quote, I share the same vision for my work as I would imagine Onyate had for his venture to New Mexico. That same makes me, it makes me cringe every time I read it. So um, by paralleling Onyate's experience to his own, Hauser is setting up a relatable narrative that foreshadows this sort of destruction and a lack of consciousness resulting from damaging colonial ideological thought. The film did not explicitly state the extent to which Hauser was educated about Onyate before he began to work on the statue, so in conversations I've had with Valadez, he admits that Hauser did, in fact, know more than he led the viewer to believe. Nevertheless, the ideological implications of the statue as a permanent fixture are well defined. While people disagree with the statue at first, Hauser is sure they will grow to appreciate it. Of course, this has since proven false. For those afflicted by the colonial underpinnings of the many statues that claim space in New Mexico and the Southwest related to Oñate, the film makes it clear that appreciation is not a common sentiment. As the documentary presents, after years and years of debate after the, about the statue, Hauser supposedly educates himself, recognizing that he's participating in colonial oppression. And he asks for forgiveness in the film by saying, quote, there was a certain blindness in the society of that time, and that blindness is still with us today. I had neglected the depth of injury that had been done to the Native American people. And that point, it's too late to rectify. It's a suffering for me too, to have to carry this because it's not what I intended for people to get out of my work and something I should have been able to anticipate and I didn't and I'm sorry." End quote. So if Hauser claims not to have known about the socio-political and historical conflict rooted in centuries of colonial struggle, can his newfound knowledge prompt him to make an even bolder move and advocate on behalf of communities that have been marginalized in this process? If his art communicates both an embodiment of a colonial era and the historical consequences of Spanish conquest, and he recognizes the complexities of this work, can and would he then have been able to support an anti-colonial struggle? How does this reconcile the debate in the film? Halter concedes heroism not to the Spanish colonizers, but to Acoma Pueblo for the struggles it has endured throughout this process. He indeed recognizes a history of oppression, but the statue remains. His project to promote a Spanish imperial legacy and its accompanying ideologies occupies the space designated by its financiers and supporters. What is the strategic effort by the filmmakers delivered to its audience then? Hauser learns something through the process, but he never resists the placing of the statue because ultimately he is self-serving just as Onyata's venture was. Another interesting element to the storyline and one that brings us back to the conversations about the linkage between Spanish colonizers and founding fathers, the title of this talk, is Hauser's father, Even Hauser. Even was, was the assistant sculptor to Gutzon Borglum at Mount Rushmore, a position envied by John Hauser. When working at Mount Rushmore, Even attended to issues of scaling, including working on small scale sculptures that would later be enlarged for the monument. This strategy was the same strategy used by John Hauser. In the film, La Las Conquistador, he shows a progressive enlargement of the equestrian statue something grander than what had been envisioned prior. To fundraise for this effort, many replicas of the statues are sold for $5,000 so that the supportive public too can share in Hauser's vision of creating a monument that secured his legacy alongside his father. John S. Hauser's son, Ethan, also participated with his father in the creation of the equestrian statue that sits at the El Paso International Airport. At the time of John Hauser's death in January of 2018, the two were working on a statue of Benito Juarez, 
His son, Ethan, will continue to work on Juarez's statue. And if you go to the website of the 12 Travelers Monument, they give an update on the progress of the Benito Juarez statue. And they are still sort of crowdfunding for the finances um, to be able to complete that statue. But it's interesting to think about in the film that the number of people who you know, quickly wrote $5,000 checks to enlarge a statue that was already largely funded by others um, to make it bigger. And then you don't have the same sort of economic capital and support by individuals to see the Benito Juarez statue completed. And so I think it just gives you a little bit of sense of where some folks' priorities were. Uh, John S. Hauser was asked how he felt about Gutzon Borgla, the principal artist of Mount Rushmore. And at the time he stated, quote, to me, Gutson was a fountain of contradictory enthusiasms from another time. His notorious membership in the Klan was unfortunate, but may have been an ill-considered and naive political misstep to secure political backing for his carving ambitions at Stone Mountain, Georgia. I don't know, but it is. It's puzzling to reconcile that history, end quote. Like all of us, Gutson Borglum was not immune to prejudice or foible, he continues, but we admire him for his artistic accomplishments and respect him for the artist that he was." End quote. Hauser appears to have disagreed with Gutson's political leanings, but he understands how one might make bad decisions for the sake of moving projects. Like Gutson, Hauser must have found it equally difficult to reconcile his own politics for the sake of his legacy, or maybe he didn't at all. His arguments for appreciating and admiring the artist parallel the narrative presented in the film, and to some degree, the view of Oñate as someone who had to move a political agenda forward to reach a desirable end. And that end to many matters more than the process. A quick look at John Hauser's website confirms a visual rhetoric that places the statue of Oñate as one of his biggest achievements. So although the equestrian statue remains a fixture of the El Paso landscape, the irony lies in the film update provided by Valadez 10 years after the statue was completed. Valadez notes, quote, the most remarkable thing that has occurred since the last conquistador was completed in November 2007 is that nothing has happened. If you go to El Paso, you will see the stunning likeness of Oñate towering over the U.S. border with Mexico, like a Roman god dominating the sky, singing of the power of glory and empire. All the while, most people who see it have no idea who Oñate is or what he's doing in this dusty, isolated border town." End quote. The cycle is consistent with the lingering debates about Oñate. They, they surface at different moments in time and expose longstanding tensions between different ethnic groups. And one thing I want to mention just in relation to Valadez's uh, quote is he says, you will see the stunning likeness of Oñate towering over the U.S. border with Mexico. Manuel M. Martín Rodríguez, who is a uh, scholar of Chicano studies who has written extensively, extensively about Viagra and Oñate uh, and who has done a lot of work in the archives, has often shared with me that there is no existing image of Oñate in the archives. And so when we say the stunning likeness, we're actually creating a likeness to something that we're familiar with. So this may not actually be the way that Oñate looks. This is probably just a way that we imagine a Spanish colonizer to look. Um, Patricia Marina Trujillo, uh, Corinne Capetti Povi Sanchez, and Scott Davis refer to Oñate as a chispa, the flyaway piece of hair that keeps resting on your face. You tuck it back, but you know it's going to get loose again and it's going to be bothersome. Oñate in New Mexico is a tired, drawn out character. And there are often conversations about how we secure this chispa and where. National debates in 2017 surrounding Confederate flags and statues in the South and monuments more generally suggest museums as potential locations rather than public sites as a place of remembrance. And Thomas Guthrie reminds us that these sites serve as an epicenter for the politics of recognition with ties to how we celebrate multiculturalism, specifically in New Mexico. The white supremacist marches and counter protests in Charlottesville, Virginia, prompted social media users and KUNM, a public radio station broadcasting from UNM's Oñate Hall, I think now they've taken down that sign, uh, to return to the topic of Oñate's legacy in 2017, and again in 2018 with the Española Santa Fe Fiestas, and again this past summer. So it didn't take long for the chief to show up again, in 2020, and in light of national political strife around Black Lives Matter movements and police brutality, New Mexicans returned their gaze to the statues of Oñate. This time, however, was quite different. And so the, what you're looking at right now is uh, the active count of the monuments that are still standing. And so in um, 
Alcalde, New Mexico, and in Albuquerque, New Mexico, these statues were removed. They were removed in very different circumstances. There were protests planned in Alcalde and Albuquerque calling for the removal of the statues. However, in Alcalde, uh, the day before or the morning of that the protests were planned to happen, uh, the Rio Arriba County officials took the statue down and placed it in a, an undisclosed location. Um, the protest in, uh, continued and there were, um, I think a lot of progress was made and a lot of conversations happened at that point. In Albuquerque, New Mexico, it was a much more violent scene. Um, the individuals had thrown sort of a chain around the Oñate statue in Albuquerque and tore it down. It also was removed and placed into an undisclosed location. And so I was just this afternoon in a conversation with a group of students from a class on uh, history and memory or monuments in memory rather. And I referred to these objects being taken down as continued colonial hauntings because although the statues are down, they are, they exist somewhere. And we know that trauma is carried in our DNA and we know that these statues are an enactment, um, a live embodiment of sort of that trauma. And so if we know these statues are somewhere, um, but we don't know where, um, they run the risk of appearing again and, re and you know, sort of reinvigorating that trauma that uh, lots of people feel um, in regard to that colonial era. So just as I was finishing my book, uh, this was in May 2020, I'm working through page proofs. This is the last stage of edits that I'm able to do before it goes off to printing. Uh, the statue, both of these statues were taken down and I had a moment where I thought, you know, I need to add more context to this chapter and I need to think more about what is happening right now. But then I sat and thought about it for a while and I told myself, the narrative hasn't changed. People have been grasping and grabbing onto this idea of founding fathers and this narrative since 1898. And we continue to revive these tensions. So this particular moment, although it felt different uh, and maybe better in some ways because the statues actually came down, um, there were various conversations had in Albuquerque about what to do with those statues. And I think right now the city of Albuquerque has not released a statement on what they plan to do with them, but there were multiple conversations that lasted over a period of months about how community members felt about it, the Albuquerque Journal sent out a poll to see what people thought about it. Uh, people as far as uh, Northwestern New Mexico said the statue should stay. And so again, people still continue to have feelings about this. And of course I wasn't in New Mexico at the time. So what Esteban Rael Galvez and I did was we compiled a bibliography, which you can find on medium.com. And we sort of created the narrative in that if people want to know more about this, this starts with reading more about our history and really understanding and not conflating um, history and literature in, um, in our path to understanding uh, who Oñate is and what he did. The latest events surrounding Oñate statues and colonial legacies show that communities, specifically indigenous communities and those who labor in decolonial politics are not easily silenced but really they never were. So we know that the colonial system is unstable. We know that it rests upon the belief that people will know their place and act accordingly. But we've also seen throughout history from the very beginnings of Spanish colonization that indigenous people were resisting in different ways. And so even before these statues came down, for example, people were throwing red paint on them. They were on social media, they were uh, being, they were being loud about their opposition. And I think all of that really matters too. Uh, resistance to claiming spaces via statues, pageantry, or other modes of colonial oppression. It's an important move for future generations. And this resistance is instructive because as we have seen, justice, especially regarding Oñate, cannot wait any longer. A more nuanced understanding of Oñate's historical narrative and the legacies it celebrates may suggest opportunities for reconciliation and healing rather than glorification. And we need to recognize that this is bigger than the removal of statues and monuments. So although these continue to be colonial hauntings, uh, just because the statues are put away does not mean that people aren't feeling sort of the daily effects of the colonial impositions. Now we need to think more about how to undo and remove colonial violence and systemic oppression through decolonial politics. We have to reaffirm commitments to each other. Remember that we are neighbors um, and to do that rather than to celebrate a man who continues to be celebrated despite the literary and historical evidence that argues against his legacy. We must see past our own complicity and consider these different fragmented pieces of ourselves as, as an integral part of who we are. There are questions that we need to uh, continue asking um, in this regard. And um, I know we're sort of running out of time here, but I want to end this chapter um, or this conversation with a poem by Chicano poet Adan Baca. And so at the beginning of the presentation, I mentioned that many Chicanos battle with their colonized and colonizer identity. 
And so I ran across this poem on social media and uh, was given permission by Avon to use it within my book. And it may be too small to read and I'm happy to share the PowerPoint with you later. But what I wanted to point out here at the very beginning is that um, you know, he's struggling with this idea of the historical narrative and having, um, you know, being both indigenous and Chicano and trying to figure out what is his place in this conversation. And at the very end, he says, Akama, Aku, I ask forgiveness for the sins of my fathers. And so I really think that um, he contemplates his path of reconciliation and he offers healing and open doors to Akama. This, uh, this particular path that asks Akama to forgive him for the sins of his fathers for those who came before him and who over time did not, did not offer the same tears and handshakes is a necessary path that can lead to decolonial liberation for all those who have endured colonial violence in New Mexico and those who continue to celebrate this notion of founding fathers. Our task then is to look critically at the sins of these fathers, at the actions over time that have brought to light painful colonial legacies and to reject these prisms of the kaleidoscope that effectively decenter or marginalize others. Celebrating a conquistador past indeed moves us to a less glorious present. Let's find a different path. And I'll end there. Thank you, Vanessa, uh, for that great talk. Um, I do want to let the audience know that um, we are having a QA. Uh, uh, with Dr. Fonseca Chavez. Um, so if you'd like, you can put your questions in the Q&A. Uh, we'll monitor. Uh, we'll start off with some questions ourselves, myself and Karen, uh, and then any questions that come through, we will, um, you know, sort of move them through the cipher and get uh, some conversation going. So, uh, so please do, if anything came up for you, uh, just put your questions in the Q&A uh, link here. Um, Vanessa, I, I, I like the, the, this sort of recurring discussion of, of how, um, how we can think about colonizer and colonized. And I think uh, Chicano subjectivity is one of these areas where, um, where we can enter discussions about how individuals themselves as being part of this heritage of colonization uh, as both you know, victims and perpetrators offers us an ability to engage in a type of uh, reconciliation process, uh, not just for between communities, but for ourselves. Um, and I, I, I think the kaleidoscope uh, imagery kind of um, reminded me of the work of my uh, grad school advisor, Dr. Marta Menchaca, uh, who in her, her work uh, adds a little sort of issue to uh, the mix around Oñate. And I wonder if, if even in centering Oñate, uh, we miss some of his story and potentially how he himself um, is also a product of the same colonial legacy that we're saying he sort of uh, is unpacking, right? So, you know, some of the, the historical evidence that uh, Marta Menchaca has able, been able to uncover sort of puts into question whether Oñate is actually a Spanish individual by birth. Right, that somehow he uh, he's a a criollo trying to or a mestizo trying to assume the identity of a criollo, um, and so I think if my my question is what happens if we take that sort of um, potential argument, uh, historical argument of Oñate's mixed race identity into the conversation around these issues of the place of Oñate as a founding father. Uh, and we think a little bit more critically about um, internalized uh, white supremacy, internalized racism uh, that Chicanos themselves have sort of had to contend with since, you know, really 15, 19, 15, 20, when these first mestizos are, are being birthed. Um, and if somehow the image of, of, um, of Oñate as Spanish is something that we've created for ourselves, not just the way you talked about that, uh, that these sculptors are creating the image of Oñate, but even for himself, how he and those in his legacy have tried to create themselves as Spanish to sort of negate or erase this mixed race ancestry somehow. Um, so I was wondering, yeah, what you thought about 
this sort of issue in the mix of, um, of a questionable Spanish ancestry, uh, which potentially extends to other um, Hispanic descent individuals in the Southwest. Yep, I love all those questions. So um, Oriate is not Spanish, he is a criollo. And there is, even within Historia de la Nueva Mexico, the epic poem, there is a footnote in there that marks him as his wife was the, the granddaughter of Moctezuma. And so there is that sort of very brief section where they sort of point toward an Aztec ancestry. And so his son would be, you know, the product of Aztec ancestry and uh, criollo heritage. And so the only thing that marks um, Oñate as a criollo is the fact that he was born in New Spain. And so we know that that's part of the Costa system and that just by way of the Costa system, he is relegated to second tier because he was not born in Spain. Um, now, I think that there are multiple opportunities for people to acknowledge that. And I think the historical evidence points very directly to the fact that he was not a pure-blooded Spaniard. I think that is something that people tend to overlook uh, when they're thinking about their own heritages. So it is a justification process. Um, I don't want to forget, though, about uh, the fact that he is part of a colonial machine, right? And so Albert Memmi's book, The Colonized and the Colonized, uh, you know, helps us to understand the different roles that each, uh, that both the colonizer and the colonized can play within the colonial system. And part of the arguments that he makes, and this again is in the 1950s, but he says that uh, whether or not you accept or reject your position as a colonizer, it doesn't change the fact that you're a colonizer. And so um, that, you know, that's an interesting thing to also consider. And then of course, we cannot, uh, we cannot say, well, he was a mestizo and we can't use that as a way to forget about what happened um, as a member of that colonial machine. Now, um, in preparation for these various anniversary celebrations, um, Miguel Encinas wrote a work of historical fiction called Two Lives for Oñate. And he imagined Oñate's life as uh, someone whom we can empathize with. And part of that was thinking about what you just said, this idea that there was a lot of pressure on him to fulfill this legacy. And he did, you know, he may have engaged in questionable behaviors, but he wanted to secure a legacy for himself and for his son. And so this work of historical fiction continues after Oñata's exile, and it talks about his life and his son Cristobal's life. And so we can imagine what that might look like afterwards. I don't, I don't know that I'm convinced in any way, shape, or form that it uh, excuses sort of the, the actual historical narrative, but it does add complexity to the, to the topic, for sure. Yeah, and I think um, uh, the, I think the, the additional point that I, that I wanted to raise was, um, you know, you, as you raise the, the point of the Casa system, we, we at least know from a lot of historical evidence that as people move north in particularly in the 15, 16, 1700s, um, they're able to leave behind their racialized past, right? So I think about like, uh, I think about the um, afro mestizo families that founded uh, Los Angeles and how in many ways in the first census that they're uh, categorized as, uh, you know, as the varying African descent categories that they fit into and then in later census start to appear as uh, as white um, identifying individuals. Um, and so I, I think um, less about the excusing of, of behavior, but how in trying to enact whiteness, what sort of um, actions that sort of has created for individuals uh, like Oñate, right? So, so for me, one of the salient points is that, um, right, that if this individual was as, um, reviling of indigenous populations as we see in the historical record, that that also is a close, um, uh, a close sort of issue that he's having to grapple with himself, right? If, if this indigenous ancestry that he carries and that is, you know, his offspring carry and that his spouse carries is something that he's grappling with, uh, how do you erase that in yourself? You can't, right? But you can, uh, in many ways, what he does, right, is he's trying to erase that, that presence in, uh, in the midst of where he is, right? Um, and so that's a little bit more of like um, what I was trying to, to sort of uh, ask if, if, if there's any way in, in the literature where that starts to become apparent. And I think the, the point that you raised, um, uh, the two lives for Oñate sort of, I guess, is grappling with some of that, right? Mm -hmm. 
Um, I think Karen um, is going to take over some questions now. Yeah. So thank you, Vanessa. That was a great, great talk. And I want to, um, uh, well, I'll go to the q and I have a question for you, but I'm going to go to, to the Q&A. So um, Diana Lopez says, thank you for your talk, Dr. Fonseca Chavez. So not a question, more of a comment. Thank you for sharing your knowledge with us. The historical markers that exist in El Paso, her hometown, highlight the settler colonial legacies that are ever existing in our community. Prioritizing the safety of monuments such as the equestrian statue at the El Paso airport over indigenous black and immigrant bodies is representative of the ongoing colonization of the US-Mexico border. Yeah, so um, thank you, Deanna, for that comment. Um, there is a book that came out last year. I can't remember the author's names right now, but it's about Oñate as a West Texas icon. And so I'd be interested also to see like how he appears within, you know, we know Oñate has a um, is very lively within discussions in New Mexico. And I know that uh, folks like Yolanda Chavez Leva and David Romo, for example, have been involved in conversations about Oñate and El Paso. What's interesting about the equestrian statue there is that, of course, it's the largest equestrian statue in the world. And so there is no chain big enough to wrap around the neck of that horse to drag it down. And it's at the, it's at the airport, you know, it's sort of in a protected location. And it was purposely placed on a pedestal to not allow for folks to have access to it. And so uh, this past year, there have been um, different sort of defacements of that monument. People have thrown paint on it. Um, there was this sort of structure built and it was a very large structure that had a boot that sort of signaled that they were trying to boot the statue over. Of course, it wasn't going to boot it over, but the, um, I don't know what her exact position is, but there is a woman who is sort of in charge of the 12 Travelers Monument that did issue a statement more recently saying that they still fully supported the statue being in there. And so I think that's an important conversation, um, especially in light of the film from 2007, which uh, sort of pans throughout uh, the city of El Paso with a city councilman who's running for re-election. And you see scenes of you know, poverty-stricken neighborhoods within El Paso. You see kids jumping on mattresses. And some of the commentary from these folks are, you know, what is this statue going to do for us? And so there are larger questions about to what extent are we spending millions of dollars on a statue to promote tourism rather than spending money on infrastructure and the betterment of our community. So I think you're spot on, Deanna, with that comment. So thank you. Vanessa, I, I want to ask you a question about, so in your epilogue, you talk about attending a conference um, in Spain, you know, where you um, received some feedback on the paper that you're presenting. And then I noticed you incorporated the quotes from Morris Chino and um, Simon Ortiz. And I'm thinking about, you know, as a fellow Ch Chicana scholar um, and the ways that we have to reckon, right, with, with addressing these very complex histories and, and identity politics, um, you know, how you negotiate representing an indigenous perspective while also, right, unpacking these multiple layers or these sort of palimpsestral layers of the, the colonial history, right, that comprise our, our identity. I, I'm not opposed to being called out for, uh, my, <laughs> for my missteps, and that has happened quite a few times. I think that uh, what's important is that we're engaging in conversation with the communities that matter. And so in the Cadencia collection, the edited anthology that you mentioned earlier, uh, Te Mariana Nunn has a comment within her chapter that says, there's no conversation about us without us. And so I think that's a really uh, sort of telling commentary to make when we're particularly thinking about representation with the New Mexico is that when I, you know, when I first wrote this paper, I was, you know, my sort of vision was limited too because I wrote about something that was very dear to me and I had not considered sort of what had existed in my own sort of home space or family in regard to anti-Indigenous sentiment. It wasn't something that I realized until later in my life where I was like, oh, that's what was happening when I was a kid. And then um, making a conscious effort to reach out to indigenous communities to you know, get their perspective and to, which will ultimately make my work better, which will make the conversations richer and more inclusive. And so I think it, it requires us to work harder and I think we have to be committed to doing that. And so another comment that you know, folks have made in the recent, you know, in the recent past is this idea that when we, when we consider other people's perspectives, we, also, we almost always see it as a zero sum game that we're somehow losing because other people are gaining in justice, gaining in you know, equality, equity. And I think that we need to get rid of that way of thinking because um, if we all think that we're rising together, then we need to be committed to rising together. 
Thank you for that, Vanessa. And I agree, it's, it's it's very complex, right? And I think a lot of us went through that in terms of, you know, especially growing up in the Southwest in New Mexico in particular of, of um, not fully recognizing, right, what was happening in terms of those conversations on the, in, our, in our households. And, and this aligns with uh, the next question. And this is a conversation I've had with Santiago um, very much. So I'm sorry that he had to log off, but uh, Carrie Ruiz says, thank you for this talk. She would be interested to know how this history is taught in the public school system in New Mexico. So I'll give one example, um, and that is of the Santa Fe Fiestas. And Elena Valdez writes about this in a beautiful article published in Chiricu a couple of, year, of years ago. But she talks about the process of the Santa Fe Fiesta Council going into the public school system to teach Spanish dances, to talk about the fiestas. And in more recent history, that has been, um, they have decided not to do that. And there has been some backlash, of course, um, by individuals who think that um, they should be able to go into the classroom and instruct young individuals into how to act like proper Spanish women and whatnot. And so that kind of decision to no longer use that type of instruction within the public school system also marks sort of the, the trend by the Santa Fe Fiestas to move toward uh, something that is much more inclusive. And, um, you know, it's been a long time since I've been in the public school system in New Mexico. And so I do remember, you know, in fourth grade, we made Pueblo houses out of cardboard boxes. Um, I, my son was instructed in the New Mexico school system. And so I think about the day where he had to come home and write a report about a Spanish colonizer. And it seemed very um, limiting to me. Um, and then uh, in New Mexico, you do have to take New Mexico history, I think in seventh grade and 10th grade. So there are opportunities at different age level groups to engage in more difficult conversations. So I hope that's happening. But again, I don't know, it's been a while. I've also had a similar conversation with Sarah Katsev, um, our paraprof. I don't know, Sarah, if you want to jump in here, but someone who grew up in California, right, having to build the missions and how problematic that is, right, without unpacking those various layers of colonial history, right, but ingraining that in a young person's mind, right, that that is the only history to be told, um, I think is, is very much an issue. Sarah, I don't know if you want to jump in there for a second. Well, yeah, I mean, what you said is true. Yeah, like the, well, I thought it was, I read that question and I was wondering if um, Dr. Fonseca Chavez, um, like if if you could speak to if New Mexico, if there have been like um, some efforts to like, I guess, implement um, a, like more decolonial history in New Mexico, because I, for a project in Karen's class, one of Karen's classes once, um, I like found a textbook that was like, this is like really decolonial textbook, but then also they only used it for like four years. So I don't know, sorry if that wasn't answering your, what you said, Karen, but. Yeah, I was thinking about, um, so I know right now, uh, Chicano and Chicano studies at UNM and then ethnic studies at New Mexico State University, they're involved in conversations about bringing ethnic studies courses to high schools. And then I know that lots of charter schools, for example, um, the Native American Charter School in Albuquerque has done sort of that decolonial work and again, so I'm not a K through 12 educator, but I am aware of, through social media, thankfully, that there are efforts being made to, to take these sort of classes to high school. In Arizona, the situation has been a little different. Uh, many years ago, uh, Arizona passed an ethnic studies ban at the K through 12 level, which effectively made it, um, they were going to cut 10% of the funding from schools who engaged in any kind of classes that there were particular things like promoted the overthrow of the US government, advocated for one race over, you know, collective identities, et cetera, et cetera. And so if you violated any of these principles, 10% uh, of your funding was gonna be taken away. This was primarily targeted toward uh, Tucson, which had a thriving Mexican-American studies program at the time. Uh, in 2016, that uh, ethnic studies bill, which was later deemed unconstitutional, uh, what they attempted to pass it at the community college and university level. And that was when I first started at ASU. And so I was like, oh my gosh, am I going to lose my job tomorrow because we're going to, because an ethnic studies ban is going to be implemented. And part of that was a result of two different instances. One, um, which was a privilege walk that was an event that took place at the University of Arizona. And the second was a class by an ASU professor titled The Problems with Whiteness. And so legislators in Arizona cited those two examples as reasons why ethnic studies should not exist. And so they wanted to um, implement that ethnic studies ban within the classrooms, but also uh, for any student organizations who promoted any kind of ideas of social justice. 
Now we've come a long way since 2016, as we have seen, and I think that uh, we are much more committed than we were, you know, certainly at that point to ideas of diversity, equity, and social justice. And so I hope that, um, I hope that that won't be a conversation in the future. But again, we, we have to learn from these, uh, these moments of the past, and we have to continually think about different types of decolonial, um, you know, strategies to be able to combat these erasures. Definitely. Um, I want to turn to a question that's in the Q&A session from uh, Naomi, who says, thank you for sharing this portion of your, your book, Dr. Fonseca Chavez. Her question for you is about the notion of founding fathers and the tendency of history telling in the US to look for white European heroes to look to recount the creation of this nation? And what would it look like to change that cosmovision or the ways that we reframe creation, foundation of this nation? And then finally, have you come across any textual or archival work in that vein? So the one essay I really like to reference is uh, Paula Dunn Allen's 1986 work called um, Who is Your Mother? The Red Roots of White Feminism. And in this article, she talks pretty extensively about the notion that most indigenous communities were matriarchal before the onset of colonization. And so we look at colonization as sort of damning to the way that communities functioned and that she is calling for a different conceptualization of the telling of our stories and that the telling of those stories and histories of the United States be indigenous focused. And so what she asked, sort of the same question that you're asking Naomi is that what if the history of the United States was founded upon indigenous knowledge and indigenous histories? And she states various examples for, you know, we know that the US, um, the form, the form that the, the form of the government that the US now has was founded upon ideals from the Iroquois nation. Uh, we know that indigenous people were pivotal to the survival of uh, colonizers, right? And so there are many reasons why we should look toward indigenous people as being instructed to how we tell the story of the United States. Thank you for that, um, that resource. Vanessa, I think that's a very useful one. I also think about um, Roxanne dunbar Ortiz's work um, in, in that same regard, right? And getting us to think about shifting, again, with your metaphor of the kaleidoscope, right? Shifting the kaleidoscope and refocusing to, to think through alternative narratives, right? For, and epistemologies really for, for understanding, right? These um, narratives of encounter um, and what that means, that it means something totally different for uh, native peoples, right? Versus the ways that we think about them from other perspectives. I wanted to ask you a question about, you know, one of the the themes that runs through your book and that you mentioned um, in this talk is the, the concept of remembering and forgetting, right? So there is this large push, right, for remembering, embodying, literally like the pageantry, right, of the um, uh, celebrations of Oñate and de Vargas, right, that uh, folks really embody that history. But what about, can you talk a little bit more about how you use that theme of remembering and forgetting throughout the book to talk about these other sort of narratives as well? I think that some, you know, and this goes back to Santiago's question about, you know, the different type of narrative that can be constructed about Oñate is that um, whether people remember um, by way of stories that are told in their family, you know, when we grow up, we know we're Catholic because our parents are Catholic because their parents were Catholic. And so it's sort of, um, it's something that we embody because we don't know anything else. And maybe we never question that, um, you know, I live in these contradictions every day because I wear a Lady of Guadalupe shirt. And then I also uh, critique religious colonization on a daily basis. And so um, part of that is me trying to uh, connect to these histories and stories, right? That maybe I was never told when I was growing up and that I came to understand as something different than what other people around me may understand. And so um, it's not necessarily so much that I want to forget where we came from. In fact, that we must remember that, always remember that and create those threads to future generations so that we always remember where we came from. But there are certain you know, dominant discourses that were fabricated from the get-go. And so I think that in essence, it's, it's important to sort of think about um, what are these fabrications and how can we um, forget those fabrications and instead rely on sort of these ancestral memories and stories and the way that we privilege, um, you know, sort of these Western dominant discourses over that of oral histories, for example, or oral, sto oral storytelling that have as much to tell us about who we are as any other source. 
And uh, the notion of forgetting and remembering comes to be most prominent in the chapter on Emma Pettis's Forgetting the Alamo, because what she's essentially asking us to do is forget that story that you see in, uh, in the media, through songs, through movies about the Alamo, and instead, let's listen to this story. And part of that is many of the characters that she talks about within her work of historical fiction never had a historical voice. And so, you know, people that were lynched, people that were killed, um, they never had the opportunity to carry that ancestral thread to tell that story so that that story could continue. So how do we do this? We do this through literary creation, of course, um, in the sense of, of Emma Pettis's novel, but because it's a work of historical fiction, it is thoroughly researched so that much of the context is accurate, but she is giving voice to people who were denied voice um, through that historical narrative. And so I think that really it's not, it's sort of a question of how do we, how do we remember what happened or how do we recall what happened? How do we come to know what has happened to be able to forge a different sort of narrative of where we were and where we're going? And I appreciate this um, conversation. It was, it was one that we started in the class when you visited uh, with my students um, on Monday. So I think it's important for us to remember, right, for especially for those of us who do archival research in terms of the ways in which I think in many ways in your book, you've you know had to read between the lines, right, for many of these histories to piece together, right, through this um, idea of the, the kaleidoscope, to piece together a narrative in which, right, you're acknowledging these multiple histories at play at the same time, right, sort of situating yourself as a subject, right, impacted by these histories personally um, and professionally, right, as you're sort of navigating um, these, these ideas, right, and these concepts together. So I, I appreciate that about your book a whole lot. I also appreciate the fact that you're drawing attention to Arizona, which I, I feel like um, in the historical record doesn't get enough attention. So can you share a little bit about that chapter? Yeah, so it is a very undocumented region and partly because Arizona and New Mexico had a shared territorial history. So when we're talking about New Mexico during the territorial period or New Mexico pre-1848, we're really talking about a larger region that you know included parts of Arizona. And so uh, the chapter that I finished the book with was more related to this idea of colonial hauntings, right? So I talked about that in regard to the Oñate statues being you know, present day colonial hauntings. Um, but that the Sonoran Desert is a site of violence and especially in the Tucson sector within Arizona that has the, the highest number of border crossings and that there are various individuals who are dedicated on different levels to um, um, the improvement of, of migrant lives, of you know, border policies. Uh, the Total Odom Nation, for example, is uh, an indigenous nation that is bisected by the US-Mexico border by that physical line. And so in that chapter, I speak briefly about how uh, difficult it must be for individuals of the Total Odom Nation just to be able to access their ancestors or their relatives, or you know, they, they don't have a proper sort of border um, on there, but it's just sort of those like metal like X's across the border, the steel barriers, where they have to drive miles and miles down the road to be able to get to an access point to drive miles and miles back to visit, you know, their relative just in front of them, right, but on the other side of this border. And I think that um, there are a lot of questions about um, how we can more, how we can see the border um, and treat it more as sort of a flow, right, for a multi-species environment. So not just for, you know, humans, but for animals, for plants, for rivers, you know, rivers don't recognize borders, we know that. And so thinking about how we have a larger conceptualization, a more broader conceptualization of what the borderlands is and does, um, the potential for sort of liberation within a border region while we're simultaneously recognizing the ongoing colonial violence. And within that kaleidoscope metaphor that Emma Pettis uh, offers us, the one thing that she notes is that violence is always part of a colonial landscape. And that is something that um, has not gone away and something that we continue to sort of, uh, to sort of uh, encounter in literature, in our real physical world, in our daily encounters, et cetera. Right, and we seem to be having a difficult time reckoning with that, right, as, as a nation, um, especially we have a, a question in the chat that goes back to um, Oñate. So when, the question is, when you speak about the Oñate expedition, is there a list of undisputed facts? Yeah, so uh, there, the fact is that he arrived on this date in, uh, in 1598, it was the date in April. 
Um, there are, you know, the facts in, there are historical archives. Hammond and Ray in, the in 1956, I believe, wrote the most sort of comprehensive historical account of, on of the Onyata expedition. It's two volumes, it's extensive, it is based on archival research. Um, it's hard to access it, particularly now because of COVID. But there are, there are undisputed facts. Um, there are things that appear to be undisputed facts that people um, don't seem to agree on. And one of those things is that after the Battle of Akama, that Onyate ordered for the right foot to be cut off of all men aged 18 and up. Um, and that is one of those sort of disputed facts because there are historians who will say that that did indeed happen. And then there were people who would say, well, that just doesn't make sense because how, how would you force people into slavery it, without a foot? You know, they couldn't do the thing that you're asking them to do. Well, of course they can, it's just made more difficult. And so there are, there are a, set of, um, a set of facts that people will continue to dispute. And I think that's what provides uh, a lot of the sort of contentions that people are facing is that um, people will say, well, I just don't believe that to be true, despite the fact that it is you know, in effect. And so, yes, there are, there are facts. And then there are the stories we tell about those facts. Um, uh, I know that Dr. Roybal in her class, they've read uh, Silencing the Past. And we're thinking about the multiple narratives that exist that maybe approximate a truth. Um, but is truth really what we're looking for? And if we are indeed looking for truth, then there are numerous voices that we need to, um, that we need to consult with. And we may, may never approximate that truth because there are, very, there are a lot of people who are not able to, um, to tell us at this point in time, right? We're filling in gaps, we're filling in silences. Um, we are getting as close to we can um, based on the archives that we have. There are extensive archives um, about Onyate, so that is not to be questioned. Um, and it would take a lifetime. There are scholars who have embarked on this journey, including Manuel M. Martin Rodriguez, who has um, at, at some points in his career has written articles that he has then um, come to redact because he has found new information in the archives. And I think that's what's really fun about it is uncovering new information and being able to present that. So indeed there are undisputable facts, uh, the date that something happened, et cetera. Um, but I'm also thinking about um, Truyo's book and the, part, the chapter specifically on Columbus and how uh, we believe that Columbus arrived on X date, but in fact, he really arrived the day before. And does that change things? Or, you know, do the series of events as we understand them still stand? Thank you for that. And I want to say, I want to be um, conscious of the time, but I, I highly recommend everyone purchase this book. I read it from cover to cover. It's an excellent text um, that Dr. Fonseca is Chavez has put a lot of work into it covers such a wide breadth, um, which is especially uh, especially interesting to us in Southwest studies. So we appreciate having you here tonight, Dr. Fonseca Chavez. And I just want to um, conclude tonight by asking what's next on your agenda for your research, because we would love to have you back again. Yeah, so right now I, I just received a grant that I'm very excited about, but um, you know, Dr. Roybal mentioned earlier that I'm the co-director of the Following the Manito Trail project, which, you know, generally speaking, looks at the New Mexican Hispanic diaspora from the mid 1800s to the present. And we've been to Wyoming and done studies and documentaries and whatnot on the Manito uh, diaspora within Wyoming. But right now I'm looking more specifically at the Arizona, New Mexico borderlands. And so Western New Mexico, Eastern Arizona, there are many Hispanic communities who migrated from central New Mexico in the late 1800s to Western New Mexico. Part of this was you know, questions of population. Central New Mexico was very populated at the time. There were uh, special government incentives to move out West um, through the Homestead Act, for example. Um, and a lot of these individuals engaged in sort of sheep herding and cattle ranching, and they built thriving communities in Western New Mexico. And over time, that sort of um, homeland extended into Eastern Arizona. So I've done a number of uh, oral history interviews with folks in Concho and St. John's, Arizona, and I'm looking at sort of uncovering more uh, thoroughly those, those stories and histories. Again, Dr. Roybal said Arizona is a very underdocumented region, and so I'm excited to engage in that work. And so for the next year, we have planned a series of community preservation workshops and storytelling sessions with those community members um, to hopefully uh, get a better understanding of that, um, that particular group of manitos from about, you know, let's say the late 1800s through about 1960s, uh, when they started to experience um, more migrations and shifts due to economic displacements. Thank you. Um, 
Vanessa, before we log off tonight, would you mind sharing in the chat the following the Manito Trail project so that folks can check it out on their own? And I want to thank Vanessa for being here tonight. This talk was wonderful. I highly recommend her book, as I mentioned, and be on the lookout. Take, check out the um, Manito Trail project. It includes a number of oral histories that I think you all will find very interesting uh, that you know, really connects this idea of diaspora right in the Southwest. And so we see these patterns of migration. And again, um, points to the, the, the fact that uh, Dr. It's like a job is raised right in terms of like the malleability of borders, but also like the blurring of borders right, especially between New Mexico and, and surrounding areas um, in terms of that diaspora. So thank you, Dr. Fonseca Chavez for being with us tonight and for this wonderful talk and thank you all for joining us tonight. Be on the lookout next uh, next block we have uh, Arlene Davila who will be presenting on her new book. So be on the lookout for an announcement about that. And then we'll keep you updated with Dr. Fonseca's research. Um, and uh, thank you for joining us tonight. Have a good evening. Thank you, everyone.